beautiful discussion. Uh, as you know, we also postponed uh, last week this webinar uh, because we wanted to uh, show respect and our support to the recent events uh, which have happened in the United States. So we also have a special thought uh, in our hearts and in our mind uh, for those special events as well. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have been able to put together quite an amazing panel uh, for you today and, and we are very excited to be able to share um, this panel and discussion with each of you. Uh, in also, uh, we would like to thank the team, both of Del Maggi and the team of Martin Montesquieu, uh, and especially William Courquin, who is on this panel, uh, for all of the work that it has taken uh, to bring to you and prepare this webinar. So this can be as interesting and bring as much added value to each and every one of you, uh, you know, as we go through through this topic. Uh, the three amazing panelists that you are going to have the chance uh, of sharing this discussion with today are uh, Steve Olson, uh, Doug Frost and Eric Durand. Uh, it's almost an offense to, to present them uh, since they are such uh, foremost experts uh, and authorities in our industry. Steve Olson, of course, uh, you know today, aka uh, Mescal, Global Geek, who has also, uh, you know, before AK Wine Geek as well. But uh, Steve is such an authority and an expert, lecturer, educator, consultant, uh, TV host uh, in our industry uh, for, for, for many years. Uh, we feel very privileged to have Steve and thank you so much for your time. Uh, also, Steve, as you know, and that's one of his uh, common points with and our other panelists, Doug Frost, together with Dale Nodogroff and Paul Packle, David Wondrich, created BAR in 2006. And uh, many of you have probably had the chance and opportunity to go through this amazing program, uh, which was funded then and which has enlightened uh, so many uh, professionals in, in our industry. Uh, they were chosen thanks to Barr by Cheese Magazine as Innovator of the Year in 2007. Uh, Steve also received a Lifetime Achievement Awards, uh, you know, and uh, by Cheers, but so many other professional awards through his careers uh, that, that Steve, thank you so very much. Merci beaucoup, as we say in French, uh, for taking some of your time uh, to be with us. Doug Frost, master of wine, master sommelier and author as well uh, to, uh, if I know correctly, Doug was a second person in history to complete both exams and today I think he's still only a few people, three, if I don't mistake, in the world to have achieved both of those remarkable distinctions. Uh, Doug has been, uh, has had accolade as master of spirits from the one spectator. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was part of this dream team that funded uh, and is part of BAR in the United States of America. And Doug is a contributor as well to so many wonderful publications from the San Francisco Chronicle, Underground Wine Journal, Drinks International, Wine and Spirit, Cheers, Santé, Hemisphere, etc., etc. Doug, thank you so much as well for taking some of your valuable time uh, and to lead this discussion between Steve and Eric. Eric Durand, who is joining us from Armagnac tonight. So uh, Eric is uh, it's in the early uh, evening hours. Eric is a seller master of Martin Montesquieu. So all of Eric's savoir-faire has been acquired after many years of practice uh, and perpetuates all the excellence uh, that you can find in Armagnac. Uh, Eric tests dozens of eau de vis daily, uh, and I know he always has his small notebooks. Uh, and so is today one of the foremost authority and expert uh, on Armagnac and Seller Master. So this is a beautiful team uh, we have assembled. We are very excited about sharing this uh, honestly very exciting topic. What if Armagnac was to cognac as Mezcal is to tequila? Doug, what do you think? It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jean-Francois. Um, yes, this is this should be a great deal of fun. I hope um, everyone who has the the spirits uh, with them that they can go ahead and and uh, you know maybe pre prepare the glasses. But we're going to talk first for a little while before we get to the tasting. The tasting really will come um, near the end. We felt like there was a lot of, of information to to impart, really, just to to give you our sense of of these really critical spirits. 
Um, I, I, I can't help but, of course, pull a quote to, to start with, which was uh, to paraphrase Samuel Johnson, as is appropriate. Claret is the, the liquor for children, port is for grown-ups, but he who aspires to be a hero must drink brandy. Okay, so we're gonna say Armagnac for now. And Steve knows that I can say that, but I go nowhere without a flask of Mezcal. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's heroic or not, but it, it, it happens. I'm okay with that, Doug. I'm with that's you. That's cool. Okay, so we want to start by talking about the heritage of, of these spirits. Um, we think of them, of, of course, in our, uh, uh, or if you're in the, in the business, you think of them in your daily life as, um, as drinks, as something you sell to people, as something you, you pour, you might mix. But it is important, I think, to understand that the heritage uh, is is underscored by the notion that uh, people had that these were medicinal, that these were life sustaining, that these were critical drinks that reflected not just the Earth's ability to sustain human life, but our ability as humans to sustain each other, and and that um, you know all the rules that we'll talk about and all the uh, the, fa the factoids that we can consider really. Um, fall under, you know, or, or have that depth, I think, uh, of meaning. At the same time, I, I'll always complain that Armagnac just doesn't receive uh, enough notoriety, much as Steve uh, complained, and, and appropriately, 10 years ago for Mezcal. Um, I, doing a quick search of Armagnac, I found that there was as much press over the last 10 years about Armagnac Blanc as, as you know, about Armagnac proper, which I, I found confounding is all, just, you know, frustrating and confusing. So if I may, I'll turn it to Eric first to, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, if you will, the healthful uh, benefit of Armagnac, if, if that's true. Certainly that it is a very old spirit. Our first, it's the oldest French spirit. Our first uh, note of it is all the way back in 1310. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Yes. The, the, the first question, the first question is, uh, where does the Armagnac come from? And uh, in fact, we don't know. Uh, Armagnac is a brandy, so uh, from a uh, uh, European point of view, it comes from the grapes. With these grapes, we produce wine, we distill the wine, and finally we age the obtained booze in, uh, in oak barrels. Uh, we know it was the result of the, the, the meeting of three civilizations, the, the, the Roman uh, who brought the, the vine, the Celt uh, who brought the barrels, and the Moors uh, who brought the, 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 the alembic. But after that, we, we know nothing. We, we don't know how brandy appeared in France. The, the first trace, in fact, it, it is the first written trace regarding Armagnac. And this this document is uh, always kept at the Vatican. It, it was written in 1310, so more than 700 years ago by Vital Dufour. And on this document, this document mentioned the 40 virtues of Armagnac. So, as you said, at this period, Armagnac was more a medicinal, but it quickly became uh, a beverage. Um, due to uh, the, the, the Dutch market. Uh, indeed, during the, the, the 14th century, Dutch came in France because they already loved uh, the, the, the French wines coming from the, the West Coast. Uh, but they had some problems regarding the conservation, conservation uh, of the wine and with the duties. So they started to purchase brandy uh, and the word brandy coming from the Dutch words brandy vine burnt wine who became brandy in English. So they started to purchase brandy in, in order to fortify the, the wine to improve the conservation uh, or they reduce the volume of the wine uh, by the distillation in order to pay less duties because it was proportional to the imported volume. Uh, they really liked the brandy coming from Armagnac so it, it really contributed to the development uh, of the Armagnac. And uh, in fact, years after years, the, the brandy coming from the area uh, Armagnac was more and more known by the Dutch, obviously, and, and the English after. Uh, and uh, between uh, the, the 16th and the, the 19th centuries, the, the process was, uh, was improved to finally become a protective designation of origin in 1936 which defined production method of Armagnac and one of the most 
important specification is that the fact is the fact that Armagnac can only be produced in the Armagnac area in the southwest of France. Now, in terms of um, uh, legal definitions at this point um, for for Armagnac, um, th these three uh, regions are they collectively one thing, or will I see on a label that it will say Bas Armagnac or or Tenerez or or Haute Armagnac? Yes, the, in fact, we have we have different we have different terroir. You know, um, uh, Armagnac Armagnac is area is in Gascony. It's an ancient uh, region of the southwest of France, uh, and it is a, a little location uh, from east to west. You have one hundred kilometers, uh, about uh, sixty miles, and from north to south. Uh, you have uh, 80 kilometers, about 50 miles. Uh, Armagnac area is located uh, on a frontier between two climates, oceanic and continental, and the frontier passes by the middle of the area. So we have uh, three main terroirs. Uh, in the west, we have the Bas Armagnac with a sandy soil and a wetter climate. It gives round and fruity Armagnac. In the middle, uh, we have the Tenares, which clay and limestone soil and drier climate. It gives powerful and floral Armagnac. And uh, in the east part, we have O Armagnac with, with limestone, uh, limestone and deep soil and drier climate. It gives fresh and spicy Armagnac. Um, I see. Yeah, that said, it's not so simple. <laughs> It's not so simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's not. For for a yeah. master distiller, I'm sure it's much more much more rich and complicated in many opportunities. So, yeah. So Steve, um, yeah. you wanted to walk us through, uh, if you will, the the origins as best we understand them of master. Yeah, that's where you have to start. I mean, as everybody knows, we've all been taught that. Uh, distillation in Mexico is probably uh, brought by the Spanish and that tequila and mezcal both all of them were probably then Spanish inventions and I beg to differ and there's an immense amount of evidence that it goes far before the Spanish and and actually there's new evidence that says that distillation may have occurred in Mexico as early as 400 BC which yes that's correct that would completely rewrite all not just not just the books on distillation, that would rewrite our history as we know it. Um, and I would say to anyone who questions that, um, you have to understand that the plant is really what it's all about, the, the agave plant or the maguey as we call it. The plant was the center for the community lifestyle of the indigenous people. It provided shelter and clothing and medicine, of course, um, and drink, but not alcohol drink nearly as importantly as all of the other things, including rope. Um, we are talking here about mezcal as a ritual beverage because that's the tradition that we are, um, that, that we trace and that you're going to taste today. And for anybody who doubts that perhaps these people had the sophistication to come up with this process on their own without being educated by the, um, by the Western world, shall we say, as we hear, you know, five white men in this culture that we're dealing with right now, we're finally starting to open our minds to the idea that, imagine that so many people um, can contribute so much. We're in this time of incredible upheaval, but I look at it more as a time of renewal and and restoring our, 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 our personal goals, restoring our own um, morals, if you will. But I, I just want you to think about this culture going back that many hundreds of years. This is the culture that brought us the telescope. This is the culture that created the calendar that we still use to this day. This is the culture that, remember, the Spanish brought back to Europe the concept of zero, which was invented in the Americas by, yes, indigenous peoples. The Indians were already computing with the use of zero, which changed the world as we know it, not to mention the color red, which did not exist in its purest form until the cochineal beetle was found in Mexico and brought back. And maybe most obviously, this is the same culture that invented corn. 
which scientists to this day still say is the single greatest feat of genetic engineering ever conducted by man on this planet. And it was six or 8,000 years ago. So if those people could figure out all of that, do you think that perhaps they might have figured out A, natural fermentation, and then B, if I light a fire under my alcoholic beverage and capture those vapors, that it would be stronger and more spiritous and more medicinal and would last longer. I mean, it's, it's kind of simple science. And as such, it, it actually goes way, way back. Now, in regards to the legislation and, and, and really the foundation for this, this little conversation that we're having today, it wasn't that long ago, Doug, you recall, we taught that mezcal is to tequila, right? As brandy is to cognac or armagnac. Right. We always said that because tequila was a specific place, the town, and then Jalisco as a region. And for us, mezcal could be made everywhere in, Mez in Mexico and all agave distillates were actually called mezcal. Now that we can't teach it that way anymore because it's actually changed. The DO now says tequila has their own. So tequila has a DO that says we're not mezcal anymore. But if you look at the 20 or 30 year old bottles of tequila, it always said mezcal de Jalisco, mezcal de tequila, always, but I digress. So now tequila can be made in the five states that you see listed here and they're in the color of light blue, Nayarit, Jalisco originally, of course. Tomalipas on the other side of the coast, we'll, don't even get me started on that, Guanajuato and Michoacan, those are the states. Now, if you'll notice that those states also, all of them, except Jalisco and Nayarit, are allowed to make mezcal, along with others. So nine states making mezcal. So mezcal now has its own DO. And we define it differently and we teach it differently. And for the purpose of this, if I can just stage what, or summarize perhaps what Eric, Doug, and I just got to is that, and we're going to cover this in great detail, but tequila has become very worldly and very popular and very, I don't want to use the term industrial because there are still artisanal tequilas made and beautiful ones, but it, as, a, as, a, as an industry, it has grown immensely and become far more international. Cognac although it's a small industry, is, is more similar in that it is refined, it is polished, it is more, again, very artisanal, but there is more industrial type of production. And I think if I'm listening to Eric correctly, what I'm getting here is that like mezcal to tequila, mezcal being the, the more rustic, more indigenous, um, original beverage, if you will, that all others come from, that Armagnac, like Mezcal, is more rustic. It's more a, a statement of the countryside. It's more a statement of the people. It's more, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, Eric, but I, I mean, that's where I'm going in regards to Mezcal, and I have a feeling we're on the same page. Do you uh, want me to... Uh, yeah. Can you just roll with this a little bit? All right, oh, so sure, sure. I mean, you know, that, that sounds cool. I mean, we, I certainly think that we um, should help people understand the, the cultural, if you will, uh, significance of these particular beverages in both uh, Gascony and, and Oaxaca and beyond. Well, if I could just say, I, I mentioned that, Mezcal, I mentioned the idea of a ritual beverage, and I do not want to gloss over that, because to us, um, it is the single most important part of what we do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about Ron Cooper, the founder of Doma Gay, and, and how he found the indigenous peoples and saw it as an artist himself, saw it as an art form, and saw them as artists. Um, but what he found were Native Americans drinking mezcal as a ritual beverage. They don't, trust me, if you ever have the opportunity to visit Oaxaca and go to one of these small villages, it's not like these people are sitting around drinking mezcal. This is a very special ritual beverage to them. And it's only used for religious ceremonies. It's used for Semana Santo or Dia de los Muertos or Navidad. It's used for weddings and funerals and baptisms and celebrations. But it's special and it's magical and it is ritual. And to Ron, it was an art form that he wanted to share with the world. And we'll talk more about how our mission has evolved to protect this culture 
these people and, and, and make sure that they can keep doing this ancient ancestral form of distillation the way that they always have. But to the people um, as a ritual, we call it single village mezcal for one very simple reason. It's several different villages. We work at 12 different villages and in each village at one family. So 12 families in 12 different villages and all of them make it the old way. And that's what we're about is showing that art form to the world and understand i mentioned corn earlier and i mentioned the agave and the importance of it there's absolutely every indication that the native americans created corn as a symbiotic partner for agape they grow in the same soils the the milpas idea of agriculture or what we often call the holy trinity in um, Mexico. But the idea that you can plant beans and squash and corn and agave and peppers all in the same area and it provides you with everything that you need, all the nutrients, all the sustenance for your body and they can all grow in the same soil and you don't have to rotate crops because each of them symbiotically works together to replace and deplenish minerals and, and nutrition from the soil. It's really quite remarkable that they understood that thousands of years ago. And here we are thinking, oh, maybe we should reconsider that science in our world. And perhaps we would have less people going hungry. But I digress, as you often say, Doug. So I'll, I'll open that door and we'll come back to it. Cool. OK. Um, Eric, the, the uh, position of, of uh, Gascony and particularly uh, for Armagnac uh, producers being, if you will, uh, victims of the privilege de Bordeaux, um, it, it, I, did it have an impact upon um, the, the way that the Armagnac industry has evolved over the years? Or is it that Armagnac was always going to be sort of a, a small scale, uh, a, 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 um, you know, a more personal kind of product just because of, of Gascony's very personality? How should I understand this? Yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I spoke about the development uh, of Armagnac due to the, the, the Dutch market, but uh, unfortunately, uh, people faced to two problems. Uh, the, the, the first one was the fact that Armagnac is a, a landlocked country. Even now, uh, you don't have any airport, any high-speed train, any highway. So imagine in the 16th century, it was difficult to come and get some goods. Uh, and uh, the, the second problem was, uh, if, even if you manage to carry the stuffs, uh, the easiest way to, to export goods was to load them at, at the port of Bordeaux. But uh, from the, the 13th to the uh, 18th uh, century, um, the privilege of Bordeaux, Bordeaux privilege, um, was in force. It, it meant wines and brandies. Uh, at, at this period, the, the, different, the difference was more tenuous. Uh, coming from outside the, the Bordeaux area was not allowed to be cheap. Um, uh, was not allowed to be cheap until a specific date. And during the history, depending, depending of the king on the throne, the rules was uh, a little bit different, but it was a, a real break on the, on the development for, for Armagnac. So it, it obliged to, to, to pass by other ports like Bayonne, but it was uh, difficult to reach. Uh, but we saw that Armagnac already existed before the Dutch market. Armagnac is deeply rooted in the identity of Armagnac people and in their culture. Because the area is landlocked, um, people had to produce everything they needed. So there were, uh, there were a lot of little polyculture farms. And in a way, uh, in a way it's, it's still the case today. So you have a lot of farms producing Armagnac, even one barrel a year just because this is a tradition and they are very proud of it. They keep stock coming from the grandfather and it is, uh, it is a part of the history of each family. It is a link between the, the, the different generations. So it is a, an important landmark for, for the people. So often they produce wine, 
for being consumed. And there are different parcels uh, to produce a little quantity of wine for being distilled. It is the, it is the reason why in Armagnac, uh, a very specific column steel was developed and, uh, and patented in, uh, in 1818 because it could be mobile. So you have mobile distiller uh, going from farms to farms uh, in order to distill equal quantities. Uh, it would be too expensive for the farmers to invest in their own steel. So it permits uh, to, to, to distill separately uh, the wine from the, the, from the different, from, from the different uh, forms. So we have easily single estates Armagnac. Um, uh, uh, Stephen speak about um, the, 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 the scale uh, between uh, Armagnac and Cognac and uh, we, we, we saw with all this history of Armagnac, and we can speak a little uh, about volume. Uh, Armagnac, it's, uh, it's 6 million bottles. Uh, it's 60% um, exported. Uh, Cognac, it is more than 200 million bottles, 98% uh, exported. So it's, it's a huge difference. And uh, in, the site, in the same time, it's two very different products. It is two protected designation of origin with very different specific specificities. The terroir, some grapes are different. The distillation method, uh, it is like uh, if you want to compare Loire, uh, Loire Valley wine with a Bordeaux. Uh, and historically, it is very different. Cognac was always a trade. As we saw earlier, Dutch came in Armagnac to, to purchase uh, this special brandy. They already traded uh, with the port of Cognac to, to purchase salt or wine. So they put in place some alembic in order, in order to produce brandy. So Cognac area was used to, to, to respond to a demand. Uh, and it is a huge uh, success because today cognac is the most renowned brandy in the world for its quality. I find that, um, in fact, I was telling some friends of mine not uh, a few months ago, before we all stopped traveling for a while, um, that it, when they found themselves in Paris, that if they go into a, a, a bistro or a restaurant, and if they see more than two or three brands of cognac, they're in a tourist restaurant. But if they see, you know, any fewer, you know, if, if they see more than three brands of Armagnac, then they're in a place where, where the French eat and drink. It, it is very much to me that cognac is an international product and, and that Armagnac, for me, um, it, it feels very much of the, the, that, that place uh, of Gascony. Yes, exactly. Uh, Armagnac... Uh... Uh, as we saw uh, regarding the volume, it's uh, half of, nearly half of the, 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 the market is in France. And uh, uh, in a way, uh, yes, uh, pe French people are very aware uh, about the Armagnac. Yeah. Now, Steve, um, we, Eric and I were just, you know, covering the differences, production differences, if you will, uh, between uh, Cognac and Armagnac, particularly uh, the, the typically single uh, distillation. Um, how should we think about the production differences between uh, mezcal and tequila proper? Well, um, it's a great question. And, and I'll start with something that Eric just said about them using the mobile stills. We, have an, we do have an image of that we'll show you in just a moment. But that reminds me of when we first started. Um, our producers, not all, but uh, for example, Faustina was the first mezcal, you know, chichicapa that you will taste today. Those of you who are with us for the tasting um, was the first mezcal that Ron sent to the United States back in 1995. It's been 25 years, believe it or not. Um, Faustina did not have a still. Faustina was a mezcal, a mezcalero, as they're often called. We call them palenqueros, but he didn't have a still. He couldn't afford a still. So there was one still in the community and he rented it. Perhaps he traded his beautiful mezcal. That's what he did because he's a great mezcal producer. But you might trade a chicken or a goat or some agave or some corn or you would barter for the use of that still. And at the beginning, Faustino had to make his mezcal on someone's rented still. And of course, um, 
you know, we went into business with him and helped him set up his own palenque. So we had that consistency of his flavor at all times. But you take me back to the beginning, Eric, with that comment, because um, that's as that's how similar these products are and how different they are from the ones they're being compared to. And I think we need to be clear, if I may, that nobody on this panel is knocking cognac or tequila in any way, shape or form. We respect and love them both. What we're trying to do is educationally share with you the difference so that everyone can understand just how different they really are. Um, William, I'm going to ask you to just go back one slide for just a moment. You had it up a moment. I just want to allude to this. You see the man here harvesting. Thank you. This it's very, very important for us to explain something um, about the way harvest is done in Oaxaca, for example, as compared to, say, Jalisco. Um, and you see, you know, we are now with vines. I mean, it's very, very rare that grapes are completely hand harvested unless they're old vines at high altitude in very unusual vineyard sites because we have created machines that actually do it more efficiently. Um, Believe it or not, and then, the, and then it's all about the sorting, right, Eric? I mean, it's much more about the sorting than it is about the picking. And, and very similarly, I think in Mezcal, if you see these gentlemen here are actually harvesting individual plants. They're not taking the field. And this is the ancient Zapotec way of doing things. A field might start, an agave could take seven to 10 years to ripen, let's just say, if we're using espadine. Now, if espadine ripens, let's say one of them ripens in seven years, but the guy right next to it doesn't ripen for eight years, and then two down, it doesn't ripen for 10. And by the way, size has nothing to do with it. It's all about ripeness. Uh, it's all about, like with grapes, we need them to be absolutely perfectly balanced. So in this particular case, they're choosing the agaves they want, and they only take enough for the roast. Then they come back and harvest the next time for the next roast and so forth. So very, very important to understand ripeness and hand harvesting, and in this case, sustainable as well. And then moving forward, we can kind of walk ourselves through the process because every one of the mezcals that we work with anyway, every one that you see, will be done this way. And there you see, again, selection. Now, in the case of mezcal, um, and what makes it completely different from tequila, as a matter of fact, I'll just say this right now as an educator, you are asked, most of you on this, on this conference right now are bartenders and servers and, and restaurateurs. And I will say that you're probably asked virtually every day, what's the difference between mezcal and tequila? And I hope you're asked more often what the differences are between Armagnac and Cognac, because we're gonna try and tell you today. But um, most of us would say, well, it's made in a different state and it's made from a different agave. And you are absolutely correct. You have done your research. However, what they really wanna know is what is the difference in taste. What is the difference? What should I expect in the glass? And here it is right here. Besides that very ripe hand harvested thing, we're talking about roasting the agave hearts underground. Now in tequila by definition these days, virtually every tequila is either steamed at best. <laughs> so I want you to think about it this way. What is the difference between boiled potatoes <laughs> and roasted potatoes? Do I need to say more? <laughs> Oats, salmon and roasted salmon. I mean, we all know food, right? That's an easy one. So imagine that mezcal, of course, is the roasted potato with maybe with a little rosemary and garlic even, you know, there's so much flavor. So this roasting process underground. So every one of these mezcals, the agave hearts or magues as we call them, are roasted underground. Now, I want you to notice they're not smoked. This is a hot fire Rocks are put on top of it. They turn into hot coals. That brown there is bagasso. That is the fiber. After fermentation, okay, after distillation, we reuse the fiber as a protection against the hot rocks. And the corazones de maguey, the hearts of the maguey, are laid up onto the roast very carefully in perfect order. So they roast exactly evenly. And then eventually they're covered with dirt and they look like a big anthill. And they'll roast anywhere from three or four up to 30 days, depending on the producer and the type of agave. So it's really, really important to understand hand harvested, then roasted. And then in the case of every one of ours, at that point, they're milled by hand or by horse. From that point, they're fermented naturally with ambient yeast in wooden tanks, open air, which is absolutely essential because we're gonna start talking now, next about terruño, or as the French call it, terroir. Um, William, you can go to the next slide. I believe we have fermentation there, if I'm not mistaken, from both sides. Um, oh, here we are, the milling. 
So, um, you know, seeing, uh, I guess, a Bucher press there, pressing the grapes gently. Well, not quite so gently with the agave. It is a tree, and that is a two-ton stone wheel being pulled by a mula, a mule, um, done by hand this way, the ancient way. And you've seen this in tequila. Um, there aren't very many producers still doing this in tequila. And as a matter of fact, this is just one way that it's done in Oaxaca or Puebla or other states. Um, oftentimes it's done with wooden bats, maybe in a hollowed out tree trunk. I mean, there are all kinds of different ways to do this. But this has become the standard, if you will. And we don't call it a to tajona as in tequila. We call it a molino. So the crushing here and then the fermentation, again, with, in the case of all of our mezcals is always open air fermentation, always ambient fermentation, uh, natural yeast, and the fermentation could last from seven or eight days up to 22, 24, 26, 28 days in some villages at certain times of year. And by gosh, look at that picture. That's Phil Ward and Misty in the background. I'm not uh, sure. Yes, who this is an idea. See that in the back. <laughs> And, and maybe at this moment, we can just take a, since we have both photos up there, Eric, if you want to comment about the fermentation of Armagnac, because it is different and special. Well, yeah, I, I did want to ask Eric to, to um, help us understand a little bit more about the plants. And, and as we're differentiating from, from Cognac, of course, uh, it's not all Uni Blanc. Uh, there are other grapes. There's Baco Blanc, there's uh, Faux Blanc, there's Calambar. Uh, but uh, one of the questions that arose um, while uh, we were talking, is how long or typically how old are the vines that are utilized in, in Armagnac? And does mm -hmm. that have an impact upon the, the, the character of the wine at, and hence the character of the, the Armagnac, do you think, Eric? Yeah, you, have, you, have, you can have very, 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 uh, very old vine, about uh, 40 or 50 years old. Um, but uh, the yeah, you have different. You have different regarding the quality. If the if the, 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 the vine is young or if the vine is old, um, you 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 are going to to produce less volume when the the the, 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 the vine is old. But uh, the, the the quality is um, is richer. But in fact, for the distillation, you know, we have to to. We need a very uh, neutral wine. It's completely different. Uh, from the, the the wine you you consume, um, so at at any at any age the the, the wine is is good to um, is good to to produce armagnac. Mm -hmm. So there's not a, a huge um, there's not a huge impact as you like you you can find with the the wine you consume. You know it's it's completely different. I see. And, and Steve, one question that arose as well is, how is it that, that, uh, that the palenqueros can decide when a, a, a mege is ripe or underripe? Or, you know, how is that decision made? And, and thus, I return to my comment about it being a true art form. Um, this art is passed down from generation to generation to generation. It's really quite remarkable. Thus, our need to preserve it and protect it. It's a great question. It's a question that will remain, we'll be seeking for that answer forever because it's amazing to me watching how our palenqueros can just look and know that one, that one, that one. Whereas for me, after 25 years of working with them and 40 years of working in the agave space, I, I still have to study it and look at it. And, you know, and I'm not sure I'll ever really know. It's something that is innate. But it's a really, really good question. And this is why it requires these people who have been raised with this insight with this intuition of understanding the the land of understanding i mean they are campesinos they're farmers every one of them and they understand the plant and they understand the the soil and they understand the growing cycle um that said you know you can visually look at an agave and know if it's ripe or going overripe for sure but what we're finding quite frankly is that a lot of people are committing pure infanticide. And we see agaves being harvested very, very young because through 
mild genetic modification, shall we say, and global warming. I know neither one of them exists, so let's not play with science here. I'm sorry. Face plant. Did I do that? I did it. I can't help it. I'm sorry. But the fact of the matter is we're reaching higher sugar levels at earlier ages in our agave, so they have the sugar levels we need for fermentation. The problem with it is they're not reaching the phenolic ripeness. And I don't want to get really technical here, but we're talking about balance. That's really what it comes down to. Just like in a grape, we have to have a balance of acid and sugar and tannins. And of course, if you're distilling with a grape, you want it to have high acid. Well, agave is very much like that. We want it to have high sugar levels, but we also need it to retain its photosynthesis, its acidity, its tannins. Well, it's a tree. So that's pretty easy, except it's not. And if you harvest them too young, well, you can certainly ferment. You're not going to get the complex flavors, the sophistication. So yeah, we're going to come back to Terruño and Terroir a lot because a lot of it depends on our base material and what we start with. Um, so moving forward with the fermentation talk, we talked about fermentation. So all of the, and, and this is the mobile still that Eric was referring to, I'll let him talk about that. This is an example of, of one of our stills. This is a 250 liter copper still encased in adobe. It's one single still with a sombrero. And you know, people get the wrong idea because we call them alambiques, that's the Spanish word for still. But it's not an alembic still. <laughs> and it certainly is not a Charente style still. It is a pot. It looks like a stock pot. It is a round copper pot that really was designed, I'm quite certain, to mimic the shape of the clay pots that they were using probably prior to the arrival of the Spanish. That is some speculation on my part, but every one of these old producers I see, all the traditional producers, still encase it in adobe, just as if it were clay, still make it in the same shape, still keep it small, one coil there in the water for the recondensation. I mean, that's it. That's how simple it is. And when you see this, you say, there's no way they could be making that magical elixir out of that process. It's just not possible. Well, not only is it possible, it is what makes it truly art. And if you look on the right side of your photo there, you will see what Eric was alluding to. This is common practice in Armagnac, is it not, Eric? Yes, yes, it's a very, it's a very important specification uh, of the Armagnac, the, the, the mobile style. Uh, but um, in fact, um, we don't have this, this type of alambic just concentrate the wine. Uh, we don't, it, it, it's, it's not, I think it's not a problem to say that, but we don't have master distillers in Armagnac, you know. This is the job of cognac. Yeah, cognac with the pot still can manage and set the 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 the, the eau de vie uh, not as they want, but it's very easy. There's a, there's a very strong know-how, and this is their know-how uh, to set the eau de vie. Uh, you you can uh, put away uh, uh, more or less heads or tails, so you can refine the the the, um, the booze. And in Armagnac, it's, it's completely impossible. So you are very, you have expert, very, very good technician, um, because it's not easy uh, to, to, to run this, this type of, uh, of alambic, but you don't have a master distiller, you know, uh, he, 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 the master distiller, when when he analyze the wine, when he when he tastes the wine, he know how he he's going to uh, distill it. Uh, in Armagnac, it's completely different. You have some some set, and after you, you don't touch anything. So, because it, it's a continuous um, a continuous process. So, it it just concentrate the wine. So it means that. The, the 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 work the job of the one grower is central you know and uh, it completely respect the style of the one growers yeah and it it is a very a very strong and uh, yes a, a very strong specificity of harmonia because we, we spoke about the the, the different terroir the three different uh, terroirs and uh, it's it's not 
is not as simple. You know, a terroir, what is a terroir? It's a soil, it's a climate, and it's a people. And uh, we don't have, uh, you know, um, very strong brands in, 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 uh, in Armagnac who influence a lot the process. So each one grows, um, and we respect that is each one grows as his own process, you know, his own touch. Because as I said, it's a, it's a part of their identity, identity of the family, identity, uh, you know, and it, it, they're very proud of it. And uh, we respect that. We don't touch. We, we can give some advice to the wine growers uh, if they need help. But after all, we don't change the way they produce the wine, the, the, the way they grow the, 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 the vine. And uh, the alembic don't, um, don't change anything also. It just concentrate the wine. That's a fantastic way to, to explain it. I've not heard it explained that way before, Eric. I, I appreciate that. I, I, uh, for, for my part as someone, when I've tried to teach about Armagnac, and again, I'm not casting aspersions against cognac, but I, I have uh, tried to explain to people that cognac uh, strives to show an elegance, a seamlessness uh, to, to its, its, it, you know, its best bottles. Whereas Armagnac, to me, ha is, is personality driven. It is not seamless. It in, instead has things that happen inside it. It's as if a, congr a, a conglomeration of people are right there in that glass. And sometimes, you know, it's a little awkward and sometimes it's yeah. noisy, you know, but it, it has personality. And, and uh, to me, Armagnac at its best doesn't, I, I don't think of the word elegant. I think of the word, you know, sort of inspiring. It, it makes me think a great deal rather than just relax. I'm, I'm more keyed up than that. I don't know, maybe I'm projecting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, is, yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say it's very, very similar to what we're talking about in, in Mezcal. It is a, a product of the land. The still really just intensifies the flavors of the plant itself. And they know that they're making mezcal and they're very good at it and they're artists but they don't consider themselves master distillers either because it's an entire process it's all of the process that they do and you know your definition of terroir is right on i would say in the case of mezcal um, like you said the people for sure is absolutely the soil the climate and for us those things influence the flavors completely so because it's ambient fermentation, imagine how much that local area, the local vegetation, because we're talking about yeast and, and fermentation cultures, enzymes, the local water, we don't add water back to mezcal, but we do have to add water for the fermentation, of course. So the local water, the yeast, the hand of the maker, the people themselves, and in this case, like with you, the grapes, well, for us, it's the maguez. And I mentioned earlier that it's, you know, it's really about the roast where the difference in flavor comes from. But the next difference would be location, 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 location. The person that actually makes it, making those decisions. And then what you see behind me here, which we'll talk about in a second, like with you, Eric, you know, you can use different grapes and create a completely different kind of brandy. Then we can use different maguez and create a completely different kind of mezcal as well. Because the maguez are as different from one another as the grapes are in their varieties. And so we, uh, it's another way for us to express terroir and to bring a point of difference to the category, which is really, really exciting. And it's very traditional. I mean, as you know, before Phylloxera Phylo happened, Armagnac had a lot of different grapes going on and people were doing you know, different things because that's what they did in their area. Um, that's changed somewhat, but you've retained some of that, which is really, really important, I think. Well, perhaps um, uh, we can uh, talk about some of the grapes and, and some of the uh, uh, mega uh, varieties. Um, uh, Eric, uh, uh, well, I guess, Steve, I'll, I'll start with you on this um, because you're, you're in it. Um, what are we looking at there on, on the left? And, and what does that, I mean, does that location, uh, which seems to suggest a plant that pretty much is bound and determined to grow no matter what anybody says, 
Um, does that show up in the mezcal? <laughs> that, that, that sure does show up in the mezcal, as you can imagine. Um, you know, it's like, it's just like with the grapes. If they work a little harder, if they have to put a little bit of duress, makes them even more incredibly complex. That is a hubbly. It's not even close to being ripe to that beautiful question from earlier. I would be looking down towards the base for some of the leaves to be starting to turn. I would be looking for the colors here to start becoming a little bit more golden in the case of a Habali. However, it, this is still intensely green. Um, it's interesting that they, they start golden and then they become more green as they get older, depending on where they grow even. Um, but the key here is varietal, um, but maybe most importantly in general for the plant. The agave plant, as Ron likes to say, it only requires the, it doesn't want nutrients. It grows in the worst possible soils. And all it wants is the cosmic energy from the heavens. It needs God and dirt and maybe a little bit of rain. <laughs> and it's perfectly happy with that. And older isn't necessarily better, but they do require a long time to come around. Now, a habali, for example, Rogelio, who makes the habali that we have the great honor to represent in the United States, is 18 to 20 year old agave just to put that into perspective, and only wild. And as a matter of fact, that's what's behind me in this picture. Those are Rogelio's wild, and here's a Tepestate. Tepestate, our, the one we represent is 18 to 25 years, right? Again, growing in the wild. Look, do you see the trees? Those are conifers. Those are pine trees, people. Do you see the pine needles in the soil? <laughs> I mean, how high in altitude do you think we are at this point? Very, very high. Now, normally speaking, we see tempestates growing out of the side of a cliff. So um, in this particular case, we're at high altitude, but we're not working quite as hard. So this agave probably won't have quite the intensity of flavor. And so we have to wait for it longer. It'll ripen earlier, but we have to wait for it to come around to its full phenolic ripeness. Um, we've got some grapes on the right there. Should we talk about grapes while we're going? So we're, we're talking varietal as well? Yeah, we, we should. Um, Eric, please, do you mind uh, giving us you know, your view of, of what each of these grapes uh, offers? Yeah, uh, we, can, we can use 10 different, uh, 10 different grapes, but uh, today wine growers almost use three types who present the, the, the best potential to produce ammoniac. The Fall Blanche is it the, the, the historical grape before the phylloxera crisis uh, in 1878. Uh, you know, phylloxera, it's a kind of worm uh, coming from U.S. who hit uh, You're the... Welcome. the, the You're welcome, by the way. Glad we could help. Yeah. Yep. Happy to help, guys. <laughs> yeah. <Get> your house. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> That's the American contribution to French winemaking and brandy. <laughs> we sent you a louse. It's kind of like a virus. <laughs> so before Philoxella crisis, the, 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 the Fol Blanche was the main grape. And to, to fight against the Philoxella, one solution was to graft the, the European vine with a U.S. vine. The, the, the U.S. vine produced the, the roots and uh, is resistant to, to the phylloxera, and the European wine produce the fruit. The grafting of the Fleur Blanche has developed a, sensi a sensitivity of the grapes uh, to, to, to the Brot Botrytis fungus. So it became very difficult to grow, and uh, you have to be very passionate uh, to, to, to grow the Fleur Blanche, but some wine growers continue to use uh, Fleur Blanche, and uh, it's very important because it gives a very floral and fresh ammoniac. You can use it young, uh, it, stay, it stays fresh, even with a long aging. Uh, and uh, you can grow Fall Blanche on uh, all the different terroirs, but uh, it prefers the, 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 the sand of the base ammoniac. Uh, then we have Uni Blanc. Uni Blanc is really known uh, because it, it is the, 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 the far main grape for, for cognac. For cognac, it's, uh, it's very easy to grow and very adapted to, to produce ammoniac. Uh, it gives a uh, refined and delicate uh, ammoniac, and uh, it is adapted to, to the three terroirs. Finally, uh, we have the Baco, the Baco Blanc. It is a, a very important specificity of ammoniac. Uh, Baco was created during the phylloxera crisis. Uh, we saw the grafting 
but the second technique was used to uh, fight the, the phylloxera and it was the uh, hybridization. So in fact, you, you cross two varieties, you cross a US varieties and a, a European varieties. Ma many hybrid uh, were developed, but uh, in fact, they gave very poor quality wine. So uh, they were abandoned or even uh, uh, forbidden. Um, just, just, um, uh, j just only one hybrid, uh, just only one survived, uh, and it is Bacot. Uh, it is the only hybrid in France used in a protective designation of origin. So um, Bacot in the world is only used to produce Armagnac. Uh, it gives a, a very fruity and run Armagnac with a huge uh, potential of aging. But, um, but is very adapted to the scent of Bazarmaniac uh, because it doesn't like at all the clay. And uh, one additional and very interesting aspect uh, regarding the Baku is the fact that Baku um, is rather resistant to, to the diseases. The, the, the Baku came very close to being outlawed just a few years ago. Um, those of us who love Armagnac were horrified that uh, it, it seemed to be that many people did not understand how Baco is part of the character of, of Armagnac. Uh, did, were, you, uh, were you worried? I mean, was it, did it come as close as it seemed uh, to those of us outside of France that it looked like it might happen? Yeah, no, I, I, think, uh, I think we are safe. We are safe now. And uh, 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 thanks, to the, thanks to the wine growers, because it's them uh, 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 who, who, who said, uh, okay, it's a part of our identity. You, uh, we produce Armagnac for many, many years with backwards. There's no problem with that because, in fact, it was uh, the, the, um, the old fears about the hybrid, you know. Uh, we, there's a, a lot of, uh, of history and uh, uh, about the hybrid uh, saying you, you become uh, completely full with uh, uh, with the with the hybrid and uh, it's it's completely false and uh, and in and, 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 and thanks to the wine grower for that they saved the they saved the, the, the baco uh, and uh, it's an important part of our, of our identity I, I would also say thanks to the wine growers for protecting full branch I'm a huge fan of full yeah. blanc, and the fact that it almost disappeared is tragic. But the fact that it's that producers, growers are still cultivating it and still making wine from it is, to me, it's one of the great stories of of preservation of of, in my opinion, in both wine and brandy, because the growers are the ones who said, "No, no, just because of this disease." I mean, it basically disappeared from cognac and armagnac completely because of the fact of, of phylloxera, you know, and we needed the, the, the berries got really big and fat once they were grafted and they didn't work. It was getting mildew and stuff, but the, the growers focused and made sure Full Blanche survived. And I just think that's one of the greatest stories. And I love, love, love brandies made from Full Blanche. Yeah. The, um, the, the other aspect that we haven't had a chance to talk to, but the previous slide, uh, William uh, referenced it is the importance of, of oak um, yeah. and the, yeah. the character of, of the oak, whether Montluzon or or other forests. Um, Eric, how should we think about that? You know, how do you view oak's influence, and and how do you make uh, choices in terms of uh, uh, new barrels and used barrels and 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 such? Yes, for for us, there's no choice. You know, in fact. Uh, uh, the, the last, the last things we grow, and uh, it's the last but not least, uh, we grow oak. You know, in in fact, uh, yes. After the distillation, we age the armagnac in barrels uh, for at least one year. And uh, uh, regarding the barrels, we can only use two species, um, two species of of oak. Uh, we can use the the pedunculate oak and the cecil oak. In fact, uh, Cecil oak is, a, is, a, is the oak with fine grain, fine grain oak. It means with fine tannins. So it gives more aromatic notes uh, than structure. As the opposite, 
the pedunculate oak is an oak with wide grain. It means with wide tannins. So it gives more structure than aromatic. So depending about the profile of your, of your armagnac, of your booze, you are going to use pedunculate or cecil oak. And uh, as I said, we have the chance in armagnac to have a forest of pedunculate oak. And we, we use it at Montesquieu uh, for, uh, for our barrels. Uh, so there's a lot of sense because the, the vine and the oak have their roots in the same soil, you know. It gives a lot, a lot of sense. That, that, makes, that does make in, indeed a lot of sense. Well, why don't we move on to um, uh, our understanding of the culture uh, a little bit more, if we could. Um, specifically, uh, maybe we talk about, uh, I don't know, Eric, foie gras. Did, did, did we remember to get everyone who's listening foie gras? It, Jean, Jean-Francois, did we do that? Did we not do that? We forgot to do that. Well, I, I, I think we should. We can still send it. Eric can prepare it, and uh, we'll make sure to send it to everybody. Right, Eric? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have to send barbacoa, too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Barbacoa and foie gras. Like, <laughs> that's yes. Awesome. Just My a delivery at home. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Well, Eric, how should we um, view, uh, for those, I guess I would put it this way, for those who've never been to Gascony, um, it is a, it, it's a, a rich and, and a, an amazing uh, landscape for food, I think. Yes, uh, I, I, I said, uh, I, uh, I explained before that we have a, a, lot, a lot of little farm or polyculture farm. And the, the, the fact you have a, a lot of different kettles, vegetables and fruit, permitted to, to, during the history to, to develop a very diverse cuisine. And uh, <coughs> you, you speak about fraga and uh, um, once again, the, the, the family, the, the family is very important because uh, the, the, the recipes, uh, if we speak uh, about foie gras, the, the recipes pass from one generation to another. And uh, people are, are, are very proud of it. They, they invite friends uh, to, to, to taste uh, who cooked the best recipe uh, and uh, in Gascony you know you, you can stay uh, one day in the kitchen to to only cook one dish uh, my, my father-in-law uh, passed one day uh, just in front of a chimney to cook a ham a ham just in front of uh, uh, of the chimney you know and uh, it cooked six hours so just and six hours just in front of the chimney just to have a ham but it's a, a fantastic ham you know and, and uh, no matter the, the time it takes <laughs> so yes it's a, it's an impor- a very important part uh, 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 of this uh, of, uh, of the tradition and uh, um, we can speak about the, the la, la flamme de l'armagnac you know, the, 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 flame, uh, the flame of the Armagnac uh, is a fact uh, to, 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 light, to light the Alembic and traditionally uh, the family and some friends uh, to celebrate the start of the distillation. You, you, you organize a meal uh, around, uh, around the Alembic uh, and uh, you can warm your, your dishes on the Alembic uh, and you cook meat with the embers um, with the embers uh, of, of the, the, the furnace, yes, you, you see a photo of the, yeah. it's a photo of uh, the, the flamme de l'Armagnac, yes. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it, yes, you, you, you cook your meat with uh, the, the embers coming from the furnace uh, and you have a, a direct distribution of Armagnac coming out from the Alambic. Uh, so it is, it is so important for them, you know, they, uh, they, they do everything, everything possible to maintain this quality, you, you know, this quality of life and uh, to maintain the, 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 quality, uh, the quality of their life. The, the, it has uh, struck me in my time uh, there or, and in some other portions of rural France, uh, how um, the, the farm life is a complete, uh, you know, it is the holistic environment that people talk about and that people 
um, say that they want to have, but of course, in the US, we just find ourselves constantly being divided uh, uh, apart. And um, do you think that that, that um, holistic approach to farming, that every, everything is being utilized and everything is, is uh, codependent, helps feed the sustainability of, of what is Armagnac and of the Armagnac industry? Regarding the sustainability? Yes, yes, I think. I think that's what I'm trying to ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true that to, to, today we, we speak a lot about sustainability, uh, but uh, in, in Armagnac we are not the best promoters. And why? Because, because it's, it's so natural. Uh, uh, as I said, Armagnac is deeply rooted in the people's culture. It is a part of the history of the history of the family. Family is, family is very important for, for Armagnac people. It's a landmark, uh, and all all the culture is uh, is family based. You know, uh, family gives sense to your life. And uh, uh, Armagnac is more than seven hundred years old, so it means that it is natural for the people to put in place a sustainable process. Uh, obviously, with the with the knowledge available at, at, at the time. Um, uh, as we saw, Armenia is a small area, so uh, uh, all the different actors uh, are based in uh, vine, wine growers, oak, cooper, steel. We, we have a local uh, manufacturer, uh, distiller, cellar, boating plant. Uh, we, sp we spoke about uh, Baco, it's rather resistant to the disease. Um, and uh, regarding the alembic, the alembic is very efficient uh, with uh, a low energy consumption. The, the wine coming, uh, coming uh, into the alembic, cool the distillate coming out uh, of the alembic, and obviously uh, um, the wine, uh, um, the, the wine, uh, the distillate uh, warm the, uh, the wine. So, uh, and you have some alembic, uh, we use the, the wood to eat the alembic, and commonly uh, farmers. Uh, use their uh, broken stakes, uh, so they recycle the stakes uh, coming from the the, the vine. Uh, so uh, the 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 sustainability is is a natural mindset for Armagnac people. I I think um, Armagnac is not criticized uh, in the same way that some people are being criticized today with regards to Oaxaca, Steve. Um, you know, there is a, a, there's certainly a school of thought, if you will, or a cultural um, attitude, mythology, if nothing else, that says that, oh, well, you know, Oaxaca, it's just being tequilaized. Um, it's, you know, it's losing its identity, the, the sense of a, a village uh, being, you know, a singular place that can, can uh, sustain itself. Uh, this is all just turning into, you know, buckets of, of uh, uh, innocuous white spirit that are going to be labeled with somebody's brand and sent to the to the uh, North Americanos. Um, <laughs> would you care? Would you care to argue? <laughs> you know? You're making me really sad right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but you know what? The po the point is great, and we've been having some really great questions that you know pertain to some of this, and I'd love to handle that. I want to. Um, I'll I'll answer that, but I'll get to it as I go back to what Eric was just saying, because I personally think with all the conversation we've had and comparing the styles and talking about the places, I think we all would agree that probably the single unifying factor here is this tradition and the people, the family unit. I mean, you look at these pictures right here, that's our 20th anniversary, by the way, and that's the first time that some of our palancaros had ever met. Most of them had known each other at this point, but we have a few that had not met the others. And to us, um, yes, Doug, that is a very real danger, and it's very frightening. And we are, many of us, working really hard, I, many of us meaning not just in, in our company, but other producers as well working really hard to make sure that doesn't happen because it is the identity of Oaxaca and other states and of Mezcal and of the small producers 
that we seek to protect. Um, I alluded to our mission earlier. I'll talk more about that, but I want to go backwards just a little bit because that picture of the food, and you don't have to go back to the picture necessarily, William, because I think everyone saw it, but we have a very, very, Oaxaca in particular, but all of Mexico, and particularly in the small villages, and particularly amongst the indigenous cultures, have the same complete passion about food, but food from the earth and food that is very, very simple. That was a barbacoa that you saw there. And what, excuse me? Look what just came, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be drinking arm and neck with you. Hey, finally arrived, Steve. That's a good thing. Yeah, it's a very good thing. Thank you, Larry. That was my daughter. She brought me a package. Um, <clears throat> we'll get to that in a minute. The, that food, like your ham, was a great story. I was just sitting there listening to every, hanging on your every word. Well, this, the same thing with the barbacoa. And the idea that that was a feast for us, you know, to them, they, they gave up a goat. You know, that's a whole goat. And that's a goat that was roasted underground wrapped in the pencas of a maguey, so the leaves of the agave after being harvested, roasted underground. There it is right there. That's Esther. Esther um, from Santo Domingo Alvarados. And it might be the greatest barbacoa you will ever taste in your entire life. I hope you all get a chance to try it. Doug has. <laughs> it was um, It's absolutely. That's great, Lily. I'm on. That's my, oh, you can't see her. That's right. I've got my screen up. We're going to get to that sustainable thing right there. Somebody asked a question about it. But I wanted to say that um, the Native Americans are also built around this corn culture. And corn is such a vital part of their lives between the tortillas and so forth. Mole, of course, which everybody thinks they know or know about, but it really um, is the lifeblood of particularly Oaxaca. And my, many people understand this. I mean, if you're a chef, if you're a cook, if you love food, there are many places in the world that you must visit, but certainly Armagnac and Oaxaca would both be in your top five. And if they aren't, then you haven't been doing your research. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely, Armagnac is the base for the countryside cooking of, of French food. Well, Oaxaca is very much the same way, and all great chefs make their pilgrimage to both places at one point or another. And some of the greatest chefs on the planet are the mothers and the grandmothers in these homes that have had these, re these recipes passed down from generation to generation. And believe me, they're not written. They just know. It's like the, the brilliant question about how do you know about the agave? You just know. You just feel it. And they know how to do this. So to your point, Doug, um, you know, I, I'm going to just get up on my soapbox for just a second, if you don't mind, because I knew when I first went there immediately that my life had changed forever. And I knew that even though I would continue doing my education and my consulting and working the way I do, that I had a much greater mission. And it wasn't me. It was us. It was all of us. And, and it, and don't, don't, misunderstand is not some sort of you know misappropriation of the indigenous people or something i'm just i admire the families and the people i've become part of their family we all have become part of their families and they are our families and to us they are the true artists for anybody who knows anything about doma gay we don't make mezcal we work with 12 families, like I said, in 12 isolated villages, and each one of those families makes them as cow, and we take the liquid from their still, and we bring it to our bodega, and we put it in those beautiful green bottles, and we send it out exactly the way they make it. We don't touch it, because to us, that is how we don't have happened to us, what you alluded to, Doug. These people are the artists. Their art form is ancient. And it is our mission to preserve their culture and protect their way of life and to make sure that if they choose to, they're allowed to make Mezcal their way for as long as possible. And there are many, many factors that are trying to make it more difficult for them to do that. And our job becomes more difficult every day, but we also have a whole lot of people, many of whom are on this call right now, that are with us in preserving that culture. And I think we share that quite a bit with Armagnac, this idea that we don't want to change. 
that we don't, what the heck? Can you hear that? I'm sorry. Oh, somebody. <laughs> Was that my phone? That we don't want to change, or at least if we do, we want to make sure it's the way that the people choose to change and grow and develop and modernize, if you will. Um, to us, it's all about the people. To us, it's all about the families. And then, of course, it's also about terroir, or what we call terruño, um, and that's not just dirt. That's the whole concept behind single village mezcal. We don't blend. Their art needs to be shown. And that's not to say that blending is wrong. That's our way of representing their art form. Um, and when it comes to, you know, this modernization of farming techniques, for example, we're not buying it. Now, one of the great questions that happened earlier is why Espadine, why Blue Agave? I mean, it's, I'm not going to be dis, I'm not going to say bad things. I'm just going to say this. You've been led to believe that Blue Agave is the superior grape. Well, that's like being led to believe that Uni Blanc is the superior grape. Okay. Blue Agave ripens the fastest and the easiest and is the easiest to grow consistently. And, you know, being raised in Iowa in a farm state and watching the, the change in agriculture as a young boy um, to where it is today, I can speak to this. Um, that's not necessarily good for the plant, and it's definitely not good for the future of the liquid made from that plant, because just because it ripens earlier and faster does not make better liquid. Um, we are huge believers in maintaining our bio culture, our biodiverse culture, the diversity of the bioculture. We're very big proponents of sustainability and, and organic farming. The question was asked about fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer is needed. You know what's normally used? The bagasso, the leftover products from the fermentation and the distillation is then laid into the fields and allowed to mulch. Now the stuff is almost indestructible, so it also protects the ground. And there are a number of other ways, but it can all be done naturally. It can be done by rotating crops. It can be done by planting corn between the rows. And this, what you see behind me here, we don't have to have a monoculture. I mean, we can't get into this conversation right now, but there are a number of different ways that agaves reproduce, and one of them is through hijuelos or pups. And that means that um, rhizomes, if you will, that they are exact clones of the mother. Well, it's a lot easier to just pick those and plant them but then you have a complete monoculture eventually because they're just clones of their mothers. Whereas if you allow them to go to seed, then they develop different DNA and then you can have a biodiverse culture. And there are a lot of different ways that we can protect this culture without, without having to take it over. We can allow it to continue to prosper and help them with providing tools to make sure that they can succeed and survive into the future. And that's what we try to do and what a lot of bartenders are out there believing in and a lot of people, there are others in Oaxaca that are working hard to do the same thing. But I must say that there's a lot of pressure to go industrial. I mean, these pictures that you saw, that last one was Faustino, who was the very first producer. This is Passiano, who the same year, uh, San Luis del Rio, that is the man whose genius brings us Vida. Uh, from San Luis del Rio, which I think we're going, are just about ready to start tasting, if I'm not mistaken, are we not? Yeah. Is that yeah. where we're going next? Uh, yes, that, that is where we would go next. We have the, the fiend up first, but, but finish, finish your thought if you want to, and then we'll let Eric uh, talk about uh, some of the characteristics of uh, Marquita Montesquieu. Well, I would just, um, it, there have been so many good questions that I really wanted to get to, and I don't want anyone to feel that they're being left off. So the one thing I would say is that anyone who has a specific question is welcome to reach out to us as a group or to me individually if you prefer to. Um, that's not a problem at all if we can't get to other questions so you don't feel like we're trying to avoid any of them because there's some really, really good ones coming through that William is sending them off to us and I want to cover them all. But trying to keep trying to respect all of your time and get to this tasting that many of you are waiting for. I mean, that really is my thought, um, to remind ourselves that this is a, a process, uh, an art form, and, and most importantly, a culture that has been passed down from generation to generation and at this point in the villages is relatively intact. Um, it's still being maintained and certainly the quality of the liquid has not changed at all. 
in the 25 years that we've been working with these families, and by the way, every single family is still with us from the beginning. We've never lost a Helen Carroll. Um, every, every single one of them is still making liquid exactly the same way they always have. And it is our mission to make sure that they can for as long as they choose to. And, and as long as they choose to, we will continue to bring it to the rest of the world. And I would say that everybody on this call and all of us need to just continue to remind ourselves that is industrialization the right thing? I mean, I think at this time of complete upheaval in our world, this might be a good time for us to re-examine that as well. Um, look at what's happening with our planet right now in, in just complete and total renewal with, with less pollution, less, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into the, I, yes, I do. Actually, I want to, but we don't have time for it here. So we'll have another chat for that. The fact of the matter is we all can, everybody on this call can make a statement and you make that statement by what you purchase and what you consume and what you recommend to your guests. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. And if you want to protect small producers, then do your research. Find out where the money goes. Find out who's supporting the land, who's supporting the people, who's supporting the culture, who's supporting the villages. Because then you're supporting people who, I mean, <laughs> we, have a, we have a way of thinking in, in our little company, and that is that every time that we serve Mezcal from one of those green bottles, we're supporting a family. I mean, that, that's that's all I got for right now. Oh, I could go on forever, but let's. <laughs> well, we should we should uh, certainly let Eric speak to this as well uh, of of to the you know the the, the mission behind uh, Marquita Montesquieu. But also, if it's okay, I would love everyone to to get their glass if they have one, a glass of the uh, the Fien, uh Armenic Fien, and and enjoy that while well Eric gives us a, a, a some better understanding behind his, his, uh, his view of Armagnac. It's Christmas at my house. Congratulations, Steve, you got it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Eric, yeah. Yeah, a few words about the, 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 the brands. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the brand is named uh, Montesquieu because Montesquieu is the name of one of the oldest French family. Uh, the first recorded trace was more than 1,000 years ago. And uh, already uh, the, the, the family in uh, one more 1,000 years ago was already in the Armagnac area. Uh, area. Um, there is three steel branches in the Armagnac area. Uh, one of them is one grower who, who, produce, uh, who produces Armagnac uh, and we purchase this Armagnac. This, this family gave a lot of famous people, uh, warriors, writers, politicians. Uh, the most famous one was the musketeer D'Artagnan. Um, they, they, they have always defended the Gascony, and uh, like the Armagnac, this family uh, is deeply rooted um, in, in this area. So it was completely natural that one of them, uh, Pierre de Montesquieu, decided one day to launch his brand of Armagnac. Um, in the mid 20th uh, century. From the beginning, he wanted to create a maison, uh, a house uh, of Armagnac. He, he, he understood he what it was important to propose different kinds of experiences to different kinds of moments, the after dinner, uh, of course, but uh, in 1953, he sponsored a cocktail book named Cocktail et Grand Cru. Uh, and in this, book, in this book, you can find recipes specially mixed with Montesquieu. So to propose different kinds of experiences uh, and to be able to re-propose the same expression in the different Armagnac, the only way is to, to blend different kinds of Armagnac. Uh, and it was rather unique at, at this time. Pierre, uh, Pierre de Montesquieu was uh, passionate by the land and by the product. He knows that uh, each Armagnac was different, so he could take advantage of uh, all uh, of all these uh, different uh, uh, expressions to to achieve his range. Um, uh, an example to understand: Bas Armagnac gives round and fruity Armagnac, um, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, 
the, the fact to blend bazar maniac with uh, armagnac tenares enhance the, the fruitiness of the bazar maniac. So to have a full range of different armagnac, we have old uh, and, and strong link with some uh, wine growers. Uh, and as I explained, the, the trade uh, relation are based on trust uh, and friendship. Um, so, uh, um, we can move on the, 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 the fin. Um, uh, with, uh, with a range of, of product, uh, it, is, it, is an, uh, it is an interesting to understand uh, what each step uh, of the process bring to the product. Uh, we saw that the identity of each Armagnac is important. Uh, so the job of the wine growers is central. Uh, and Finn is a uh, blend of young, uh, of young Eau de Vie, of young Armagnac, from two to four years old. So the extraction of the woody note is not finished at this time. So it is the, the expression of the booze itself, you know. So the expression of the wine growers. So in the fin, the, the different booze uh, come from uh, Bazar Maniac, uh, Terroir and Tenares with a majority of, uh, of Bazar Maniac. So you already, you already tasted it? Yes. It's, so. it's, yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely Armagnac. Um, for, for me, it, it has, um, you know, as you say, it doesn't have sort of the depth of long-term uh, barrel maturation. Instead, it has uh, sort of the, the, the uh, 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 I guess I would say the primary notes of barrel. So butterscotch, caramel, um, some cinnamon, some, you know, nutmeg and allspice, all these characteristics that are certainly going to come out of the wood and, and then there's a honeyed note and and the fruit expression itself the 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 marker that i always look for in armagnac and as i say it, it isn't always easy to differentiate armagnac from from cognac but for me armagnac because of this uh, this terroir you can get these kinds of deep raisin uh, fig notes but at the same time you get those you can get very uh, uh, like this has lemon zest. It has tartness to it. So you get this kind of yin and yang uh, uh, characteristic to Armagnac, whereas to me, cognac occupies uh, uh, the big center. So I, but I love that tension of Armagnac, and this, this seems to have it to me. Yeah. I, lo I love the fruitiness of it, too. It's so bright. It's it so is. bright. You know, it, it, like you say, it's not, it, it, the wood is beautiful, but it's integrated. Yeah. I love that combination that, of fruit. Lemon zest across the top. I mean, you know, yeah. you would never get that in cognac. That would never happen. Well, let's not. Completely. Well, but I mean, <laughs> it, it wouldn't present the same way, you know what no, I mean? it would not. You're exactly yeah. correct. I mean, that, that, and that is, and that is the key. We want to know the differences. And this is, it, yeah. this me is quintessential. Different. Yeah. This is brandy from a different place. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we, should we go to the, be crazy and go to the Vita now? Or do you want to do the reserve? Uh, next, the two Armagnacs next to each other. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, Eric, you, you decide, but I'm thinking it might be better to do the two Armagnacs side by side so people can see the development of Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I know. That makes sense? Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. I think when you do them side by side, you get a chance to, to really experience the difference in yes. the blend and the difference in the age and the wood and the impact of the wood. Yeah. And one That's of the things I have great. to say, and I'm not saying this just to, because Eric's here, but I'm, to me, Eric is a master of this integration. I, I find that with everything he touches, the oak never, it's always there. It's always important. It always lays the foundation. It never takes over. And I, I applaud you for that, because to me, that's one of the great dangers in all blended spirits and in all spirits that see oak aging, where the oak takes over. And while oak is absolutely essential to our mac, I mean, you have a, a beautiful knack, even in your oldest ones, where the fruit always shines. It's always based on terroir and fruit. And I, and I applaud you for that, because to me, that's, that's one of the biggest differences. That's one of the iconic um, expressions in your glasses, to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sion. The, the yeah. reserve, if people have put their noses in the reserve, immediately it expresses 
greater age. You know? I think it's, it is the, the extra old, no? Uh, I have I've received I received reserve. No. Yep. You you can go through the uh, yes we uh, you can it is uh, extra uh, it was put reserve but it is the extra you're correct. Uh, ah, very good. Just labeling because the very first note I get is marzipan and marzipan for me means time in barrel you can't yeah. you can't cheat that it means this is this has significant time in barrel and yet it's still bright and fresh. It has lost none of its, uh, you know, uh, fresh character. In in no way, shape, or form would I say, "Wow, this has been in barrel too long." But that's why I was like, "Wow, the you know the character of this, the, you know, it it is age that provides this." I think. Yes, yes. Uh, extra old is a is a totally different product uh, from the the, the fin because uh, extra old, in fact, summarizes uh, what the role uh, of uh, Sela Master is. Uh, you maintain strong, strong links with the wine growers. You select the different harmoniac. You select the wood and the toasting. You raise all the different harmoniac, uh, and you some of some of them you are going to use it. But uh, for some of them, it will be the next generation of seller master, and um, and and. In fact, in the in the in the extra oil, some of the Armagnac are 40, 40 years old and more. So uh, this type of blend is very is very mature. And at this point, at this point, what is important is the terroir. You know, uh, with with the aging, the, the, the different Armagnac has lost uh, its freshness. The woody notes are melted. So. The, the so the, the terroir is showcased, you know, uh, and uh, at Montesquieu uh, and uh, and thank you for, thank you to Stephen because uh, you, you said that very well. We don't put a lot of wood, you know. You don't want to hide to hide the personality of of the of the of the eau de vie, you know, because to 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 understand the importance of the terroir. You don't have to put a lot of too much wood in the harmony. Wood is just here to 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 make your your product richer, to support the eau de vie, but not to change uh, to, to to very to, to 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 change a lot your product. I'm glad you said that when you did because I was just about to tell you that <laughs> to me, <laughs> no, this is the perfect expression of integration. It's just, it's so well integrated. The, the oak is there and it is essential. And it is a big, as Doug alluded to, it's not just the flavors of the barrel, it's the time in the barrel that have brought this nuttiness and, and this, um, it, it, like the, the confectionery tones and the marzipan that is clear. But to me, it is still terroir based and still fruit driven, just more intensity across the board each of the different areas are more intense. And to me, that is impeccably well integrated. That is a masterful integration of oak. And, and I urge everyone who's tasting it to just lock that into your memory banks because that is, that is the shining example of what it can be like when it's done right. In my opinion, I'm again, this isn't just because Eric's here. This, there, there's a reason that, we came together to do this. I'm a, I'm a big fan. And this, to me, is a, a true expression of harmony. It's beautiful. It's really, really good. I'm just going to sit here. You guys go ahead. I'm going to be over here drinking this. <laughs> oh, wait. You want me to tell them about mine now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will in a second. I'm happy. But but Eric, um, once again, for me, this still expresses Armagnac so completely in the sense that there is uh, some of that underripe or at least uh, tart and fresh fruit but uh, the, the marzipan is only one element of the depth that starts to develop where you get the fig and the raisin and the date and, and a chocolate uh, note almost to, to the very end of this. It's as if uh, the, the spirit just keeps growing in, in weight and volume the longer it sits in your mouth, the longer the finish goes on. And, and that to me is, is bloody exciting. I mean, that's why I love these things.
Yes, and it is the expression of the different terroirs because, in fact, the, the, the fruitiness is given by the bazar maniac and all these lengths, you know, is given, is given by, the, by the powerful of the tenares and the tenares support, support these, uh, these lengths. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Well, I, I, there, there's no point in waiting until the, the finish is over for this spirit because we don't have that much time. I was going to say, Doug, yeah. we can come back tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, shall we? <laughs> the like the finish here. I'm just sitting here going, "Come on, man!" I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. That's such a beautiful product. That is really, really lovely. That is yeah. that something that deserves to be sipped and savored and 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 languored over. That needs time. It just yeah. not not that it needs time to be better. It needs time to be appreciated. Yeah. I just want to sit on it for a while, you know. It's yeah. Beautiful nuttiness little little dark chocolate well let's let's talk vita shall we shall we have some vita yeah we shall um i just happened to be able to hold that right oh you can't there there it is anyway it's it's on there vita um for us so the two mezcals that we're tasting today we'll taste vita and we'll taste chichi kappa um they tell the history it is uh we are celebrating 25 years our founder my partner my brother Ron Cooper, a brilliant artist in his own right, you know, went to Oaxaca to, to make art. And there he discovered a, an art that he wasn't very familiar with and it blew his mind. And when he actually saw how these artisanal mezcals were made um, and met the people that made them, he considered their mezcal liquid art their process performance art and he set about trying to share that with first his friends and later the world and of course the mission at the beginning was just to you know share it with his friends and do art but when he was told he couldn't you can imagine uh, if you know ron cooper at all you just don't tell ron no <laughs> or do because it got all of us this when I met Ron, um, I had flipped over his liquids. Um, I'll never forget Doug and I blind tasting them in a, in a spirits tasting and the, the, a new one that we hadn't had yet where it was just a year in and we, we freaked out that we just flipped. And my good buddy, Jimmy Yeager, um, who you know was one of the early, early pioneers. And Jimmy and my wife, Melissa, and I went down there because we had to see it for ourselves. And there's just no way this liquid come, could be made in this primitive, primitive way. And yet it was, and it was, and when we met the people, like I said, it changed my life forever. So in the case of Vita, um, this is made by Pastiano in San Luis del Rio. San Luis del Rio, um, when we first started going, when Ron went there the first time, um, there was, one telephone in the middle of the village and it was just a couple hundred people and there were only a couple of producers at most um these days san luis del rio has become a much more thriving metropolis i think there might be 400 full-time residents now but there are over 20 producers um and it, it is one of the centers of artisanal mezcal production for sure pasiano being the leader of that it is 100% Espadine. It is made in this single village, in one facility, completely artisanally, completely traditionally. It's an underground roast, natural fermentation, 350 liter copper stills. Um, Passiano, it, it's a great story because Passiano's son Marcos um, came home after working in the United States, as most Oaxacans do at some point. They Many, many members of the family have to go to the United States to work, to try and send money home so that their families can eat. If you don't know Oaxaca, I mean, things have been a bit better lately because of Mezcal and a resurgence in popularity, but it's a very poor state and a huge indigenous population. And um, as a result, many of the people go to the United States to work. And we're thrilled that Marcos has been home. Marcos makes Vida. Marcos, for those of you who know San Luis del Rio, also Paciano and Marcos make Madre Cliche, which you may have tasted. The recently released Toba Ciche, the Azul. Um, so they make a few different things. Um, but this is Vida. And some people would say, oh, that's your entry level. I'd say, go ahead and taste it and tell me that's entry level. Okay, um, it is 
completely 100% handmade artisanal mezcal. And it speaks of San Luis. I will tell you, those of you who are big fans of San Luis del Rio as the single village mezcal, and you should be, Vida is even more intense. <laughs> Because as we distill to lower proof, it's more acid, it's more flavor, it's more intensity. Um, it's just a little bit lower in alcohol. And Passiano understood very early, even though it took us years to figure out how we could continue this exact artisanal process and not change anything, but just distill to slightly lower proof. And it became the mezcal that so many bartenders use in cocktails. And you'll see that it is absolutely terroir and fruit driven. Um, it kind of like Armagnac without the wood, you know, it's, it's all earth, it's all soil, it's all minerality. And then this incredible tropical fruit, just in beautiful, bright acidity, very long finish, very full bodied mouthfeel. Um, it is a mezcal designed not to be designed. It's, it's meant to be sipped and savored like all of the Del Maguey single village best couch. It just so happens because it's a little lower in alcohol, we can bring it at a little lower price point. We can make a little bit more volume because instead of going with bigger stills or huge fermentation vats or big ovens, we just did more of them and made it lateral. So where, when we first started working with Pastiano, he had one still. You know, today he's got 13. So, you know, it's a, but he still manages all of them by hand, each one. So it's nothing has changed, which is quite remarkable. The second mezcal uh, speaks a completely different story. And in this particular case, we decided to do the same varietal, if you will, Espadine, so you can see just the impact. What we're talking about, Terunio, they're, they're as different as night and day. Well, part of that is, of course, the hand of the maker. They make different decisions about different things. There's no question part of it is the source of the maguey's, where they come from, where they're grown, how they're grown, like with grapes. But a big part of it is place, where it's, and this is where process becomes so important with the mezcals when they're made the artisanal way, is that how it's roasted, how it's ground, where, those native yeasts are coming from the local water, in this case, well water. Um, Faustino was the first palanquero that we started working with. Both of these are here because since we're celebrating 25 years, they're both 25 years old. Not the bottles that you have, but the actual relationship with the palanqueros. And they've both been in the United States, not Vida, but San Luis del Rio and Chicapa. And then Vida was launched in 2010 um, as uh, another line from that single village. And you'll see that Chichicapa is a completely different animal. It's also completely traditional. And it's also made, by the way, there's a great story. Max came home from picking tomatoes or grapes, or depending on the, the season in the United States, sending money home to his family. Now Max is home because, because of all of you, because you are now consuming mezcal and sharing it with your guests. There's a reason for these people to come home and work in the family business, which is absolutely beautiful. And Max and Faustino are partners and they make the mezcal together. They started with one still, they now have three stills, which is, oh my gosh, you know, three 300 liter stills, just to give you an idea. But Gigi Kappa is the, um, as Ron describes it, it is the quintessential uh, or the archetype, as he says, of a broad valley mezcal. Whereas in, in San Luis, you get that tropical fruit and a, an intense minerality. Here you get much rounder, softer, deeper, darker flavors, maybe a little chocolate, a little bit of spice. Um, it comes from not a warmer area, but more of a, an open valley. Whereas Vida comes from and a very narrow river canyon with very steep slopes. And the agaves come from really steep up on the slopes, even though it's distilled in the river valley. Whereas Chichicapa, it also comes from slopes, but there are more of those hills in the central area of Oaxaca, and it's a big open valley. So it's really the yeast and the water that make a lot of the flavor, and then of course, the hand of the maker. The families are different, they have different. The process is almost identical, and yet, the decisions made by the individuals 
is what makes them so unique and so different. So I could go on forever, but I won't. I hope that you enjoy them. Uh, by the way, don't confuse and think that you have to use Vita and cocktails and that you have to sip Chichicapa. You can sip them both. And by the way, they both make really good cocktails too. <laughs> because to me, one of the things that I think we want to talk about, if you don't mind, yeah. if I can take us there, Dougie, is that, <laughs> You know, we both feel, and, and we've done a much better job, you have, thank you, of recognizing mezcal as a potential cocktail um, liquid. Uh, we don't feel that we've done nearly as good a job with Armagnac, and maybe we can help. But I will tell you this, in the beginning, everyone thought mezcal could not be blended. There was no way you could make a cocktail out of it. And we use a little tiny bit of it, and you can smoke in margarita, the very first cocktail. Yep. Mark Miller, Coyote Cafe, the yep. smoky margarita made with a float of chichicapa on top of his El Tesoro and Grand Marnier margarita. There you go. That was the original drink. Yeah, that was the one. That was all we could do. And, and it was too idiosyncratic and too smoky, and there's no way you could ever make it work. And then we started putting it with all kinds of fruit juices because that would work. You know, we'll do it tiki, we'll do it tropical, and that works. It's really cool. And then, well, we started thinking about it differently. And I'll never forget when Phil Ward created the Oaxacan Old Fashioned. He was, um, he was a, is a mezcal fanatic. Um, and when he created the mezcal Old Fashioned, by blending it with tequila, because that's the only way we could get people to think about mezcal, and then eventually it became on its own. People started going, oh wait, that's right, we drink it straight, why wouldn't we drink it more in a neat style of cocktail? And I think that most people have found today that its true calling seems to be with vermouths, with amaro, with bitters, um, in stirred drinks, stronger, uh, where it really showcases the mezcal. Instead of using it as a flavor component in a cocktail, we use it as a base and enhance the mezcal and think about it just completely differently. And I feel like, Doug, I'll, I'll throw this over to you. I feel, and you, you certainly comment on mezcal because you've had your fun with that, but I feel like we're at a, a similar crossroads, if you will, with the um, Armagnac. Because for me, I see Armagnac as, first of all, a very oftentimes more affordable alternative for brandy in any classic brandy cocktail. Um, but I see particular brandy cocktails that to me with Armagnac, it just speaks volumes. Um, for example, a Vucare, which is one of my favorite cocktails on the planet. But why would you not put Armagnac in there? It just makes perfect sense to me. Or, you know, I, you know, I love the sidecar as much as anybody, but I've always thought the sidecar was kind of the evolution of laziness from the original Crusta. And I, I know people dispute my opinions, but I do have evidence that, you know, the sidecar was the easy way of making something taste almost as delicious as a Crusta. And the Crusta, is a, it takes a little time. But it takes time many, to do the peel right, you know. If you you gotta do the peel right, and you gotta coat the glass with sugar in advance, and it has a couple more ingredients, and it needs, it's what makes it more exciting. It's got bitters in it, it's got maraschino in it, but made with Armagnac? Oh my. I'm sorry, but I'm, 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 I'm going on. You jump in there, Dougie, anytime. Well, I, I, I will, only in the sense that um, it's always important for people to remember that that uh, for much of the development of the cocktail, which let's uh, agree to agree, I hope, that uh, that, that history begins uh, mostly in the eastern portion of the United States, that a lot of these cocktails were originally made with a brandy. And a, I say a brandy because brandy wasn't necessarily cognac back then. Brandy could be brandy from just about anywhere. And, and so when we talk about the Vucare and, and the Brandy Crusta, and the sidecar, yeah, absolutely, you can you can put Armagnac in there, but you can also consider uh, cocktails as as simplistic as the julep being okay with brandy, and i.e. Oh, yeah. okay with an Armagnac, uh, I should say, with a brandy that has a distinctive personality like Armagnac. Um, so I, I I just feel that uh, my, I guess my chief complaint is as simple, simplistic as this to say 
as somebody who's actually a, a, a working restaurateur at this time too, because I, I, I work with a particular restaurant in Kansas City where I live, when I go to the distributors and say, yeah, show me um, what, what different age uh, Armagnacs I can get. They're all like, oh yeah, uh, well, you know, we got a VS. I'm like, okay, uh, from whom? Oh, just one person. You know, it's like, it's maddening because the distributors won't take that step. Now, I, 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 it's easy to bitch about distributors because as restaurateurs and, and bar people, that's what you do. But in having been a distributor in their defense, it's like, yeah, how often have I walked into a restaurant and said, yeah, tell me about your Armagnacs. And there's a long pause. And the bartender looks back and kind of stares around for a little while and goes, oh, 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 there's one. There's one? I mean, what the hell is that about? And, and I come back to that, that idea that, uh, you know, I tried to seed the conversation with that in, in uh, France, I would only have that experience if I was in a tourist place. But, you know, if I was in a, if I was in a, 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 a restaurant that was pop, uh, peopled by and, and, and enjoyed by people of the area, there would be multiple Armagnac options. And I just think that it's crazy, it's maddening to me that those options don't exist in American restaurants and American bars uh, at this time. I, I think it's time for people to, to show a bit of, of, of guts and, and demand that distributors do what distributors want to do, sell you things. So, you know, you gotta ask for them first. I, I have a feeling John Francois would have some very strong opinions about that. I would endorse everything that you're saying right now, Dougie. I just got to say, you know, for those of you out there that, you know, have poo-pooed drinks that maybe, I mean, some of us grew up making because they were so popular at one time, things like, you know, Brandy Old Fashions or Brandy Manhattans. I'm just going to say, instead of poo-pooing it, fix it, do it right, turn it into a stirred drink, if you've never tried an Armagnac Manhattan, you have no idea. It's, I'm sorry, but go do one tonight. Make one. Take what's left of your fiend and put some really, really good red sweet vermouth in there and some mango and an orange. Do an orange peel over the top. It'll blow your mind. It'll absolutely blow your mind the way the Arbignac carries. Uh, and they're radically different. If you're going to use Dolan Rouge, you're going to use Carpon Antica, you're going to tr completely, those are two radically different cocktails, both damned delicious. That's right. That's right. I mean, but, you could stay French just yeah. because you're an Arbignac and <laughs> it is made relatively close by, but I'm just throwing it out. A play. <laughs> That's all. That Doug and Stephen, and those will be first. We will make those tonight, and we'll certainly be thinking <laughs> of all of you, and maybe even tomorrow night. But uh, it's uh, it has been such a, a, a pleasure uh, sharing this moment with you, and I, I think all of the people who have joined us have, have really enjoyed this. One of my quotes from Michel says, "Can we bottle this passion?" Uh, and I <laughs> we think do. that's. Beautiful quote, and you do. Well, we do. Exactly. <laughs> and, and this has been uh, so um, interesting, educating, enriching. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Steve, Doug, Eric, uh, for sharing your time, your passion, your expertise uh, with us. Uh, we, we did it really the French way. We said we one hour, it was two hours, so we are right on time. So right on time. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, for all of you, we have recorded uh, this session, so we will uh, make it available. We'll make sure we we'll send it to you. Um, if if you have any question, we have shared our email address. Do not hesitate. We we'll gladly pass them on to Doug, Steve, and Eric, so they can uh, share them back. I, I think what you have seen and why we put this panel together is because we. We have such a passion uh, for this industry. Uh, there is so much uniqueness, savoir-faire, know-how, history and authenticity in Mescal and Armagnac. And it is really exciting. And, and, I, and I, we all believe that it is also part of what we need to do to share this history and authenticity that you then can share it with others uh, because it means something. You know, it really means something. And authenticity needs to have a larger uh, part of our industry because the women and men 
who are behind those beautiful, beautiful products and have been for centuries. That's what they do every day. I mean, they work hard. They have so much heart, so much passion, and they put all of who they are and what they know into those beautiful products. So uh, again, Doug, Eric, Steve, from the bottom of our heart, thank you so much for joining us. Exactly, Eric. William, thank you again for making all of this possible with us and the team at Del Maggi and Marquis and our BCI team. We, will, we shall do this again. We need to make each other this promise because it was so much fun. Fantastic. Thank you. And again, thank you to each and every one of you for joining us and we shall say a bientôt. Hola, hasta luego. Thank you. Hasta luego. Thank you.